I mean, even when you work with trusted collaborators, there will be moments on set where there is Sturm on drain. And as the director and as the writer and as the producer, you have to be able to solve those issues. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur: how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Scott Cooperman. How are you doing, Scott? Great. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for coming on the show, man. I, I'm a fan, man. I've been a fan for a while, man. You, you're you doing some really good work, brother. Seriously, man. Thank you. Thank so you. Con- it's tougher and tougher. It's, man, I could... <laughs> I was just talking I was just talking to somebody uh, a few minutes ago about how the movie business is changing so dramatically even from when you made Crazy Heart to now oh. getting somebody to the movie theater if Avatar is having a problem I mean well, is Avatar what? having a problem You know I suspect I, people will go out for that film I did no I I saw it it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in in my life like what Jim what Jim did was Yeah no surprise be, it's remarkable, but and it's doing well, but people are like, oh, it should be doing better. And there's a lot of pressure on a movie like that. But other than Avatar and Top Gun last year, it, it's tough to get people out into the theaters, man. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, maybe that was happening also a little bit before COVID, certainly accelerated during COVID. Um, look, it's expensive to get a <laughs> sitter and dinner and parking and then the price of uh, – of a, of a movie, maybe for the kind of movies that I make and some of my favorite filmmakers, perhaps the ticket prices should be lowered. And then people right. will be more likely to come out because um, there really is nothing like experiencing oh, film in the cinema. And uh, uh, in fact, the film w- will not have the same effect on you, regardless of what it is, if you're watching it uh, anywhere but in the cinema. That, there's no there's no question my friend but but you've lived a very interesting life in the film industry you 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 came up uh as an actor so my first question how did you and why did you want to get into this insanity that is the film industry well look it's uh you don't choose your obsessions your obsessions choose you right very much so i also spent uh i was born and spent a lot of my formative years in this kind of artistic crown jewel of virginia called Abingdon, virginia where the state theater is also a lot of great uh music comes out of that that region the mountain empire as well as a lot of arts and crafts so the arts were always a part of my life uh my father would take me to see uh films at a young age at a local uh college um, and then, you know, when you're young and you're transfixed by that, and you also have spent time as, as an actor, uh, Christian Bale and I had discussed this, that, that, that people who get into the film business aren't meant to have office jobs. And I think I realized oh, yeah. that at a young age. I also realized at a young age that there were actors who were a whole lot better uh, at this vocation than I, especially when you're uh, on the other side of the camera and, and, and your first film is you know, you're you're recording Jeff Bridges for posterity and Robert Duvall and and Maggie Gyllenhaal and Colin Farrell. That quickly uh, um, makes you realize <laughs> that uh, there are people who do it a whole lot better than you. And then my second film was Christian Bale and Casey Affleck and Woody oh. Harrelson and Willem Dafoe and Sam Shepard and and Forrest Whitaker and Zoe Saldana. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm definitely not going to be an actor again. So, uh, but quite honestly, Alex, this is, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine a better job than being a, a film writer, a film director. I mean, I suppose being Mick Jagger or uh, Bono, Bono, <laughs> Eddie Vedder, you know, someone who's a rock star, right. And, and sings to um, 80, a hundred thousand people on certain events. Uh, but uh, I love being able to express myself as a filmmaker. I love the people that I've met over the course of my career. Uh, I mean, look, I've been, uh, for an actor with an unremarkable career, I have been incredibly fortunate as a filmmaker. I'll just say that. You know, it's it's interesting because a lot of people are like, you know, everyone could play basketball. You know, generally, everyone could take a ball and try to sure. make a shot. But we're not all Michael Jordan or LeBron James. And well, and that's I think that's where you were at. <laughs> Well, sure. I mean, even Robert Duvall, uh, who was my mentor and and, uh, expressed to me and still does how much he liked me as an actor. Jeff Bridges, the same thing. But 
but uh, I just have much more fun doing this. And, and I never even really had uh, a chance to grow as an actor. I wasn't getting the kind of challenging parts that, that I now write for actors and I adore actors um, and performance is critical to me and, 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 and working with actors that I've always uh, uh, admired uh, and, and, you know, also being able to um, work with actors that teach me something as Jeff certainly has, or, or Robert Duvall or, or Christian um, or, or even Johnny Depp. So um, I'm blessed, man. I, I, that's, that's just the truth. So at what point, uh, cause I'm assuming as you were going down the path as an actor, uh, mm -hmm. there, there might've been some rejection, not much, I'm sure, but some rejection. <laughs> a lot I know the actor who isn't, who isn't rejected <laughs> exactly. a lot. Right. He, so he, at what male or, he started at 12. I mean, so yeah. Oh, yeah, God, yeah, yeah. He had, he had a good start. That's little Spielberg uh, independent film thing he did. Yeah. Um, the, but Indeed. so when you're going, so when you're going through the the acting process, at what point did you say, you know what, I, I'm I'm not going to hit the all star team as an actor. I want to jump to the other side of the like. What was the point when you decided I'm going to well, write crazy? I was, hard? I was just uh, auditioning a lot and, and you know kind of becoming a bridesmaid, coming in second, and uh, yeah. uh, and and we're, and and not getting the parts that made me want to become an actor in the first place. I think everybody who's, you know, a young actor coming up in the nineties wanted to, you know, a career, at least I did like Sean Penn or, or De Niro, no. right. Or, yeah, or yeah. Hackman or Pacino. So when you're not getting those parts and uh, you're going up for leading men and you're not really loving them, but you have to support yourself. It just, ultimately the rejection, it's a lot. Um, and I mean, look, we all get rejected certainly in the art. Sure. When, when you make things that, that, that take big risks for sure. But uh, it was really just the, the continual process of, of auditioning and films that I would have liked to have been in, not getting parts in them, um, whether it would be Thin Red Line or, or uh, Saving Private Ryan. And then I was doing a Western with uh, Duvall being directed by the great Walter Hill, who's also a mentor of mine. And, oh. and um and Duval said, you know, you should really write something. And of course, I ended up at, at the time I had been spending a lot of time uh, considering writing a film about Merle Haggard. Uh, he had too many ex-wives, getting the rights were difficult. So I ended up writing Crazy Heart and Duval was the first person to read it. And and, you know, Alex, the truth is when Jeff Bridges says yes to your film, it changes your life. And that's exactly what happened to me. How so? Is that how you got the? Because I was going to ask, like you're basically a first time filmmaker at this point. Yeah, you've been on oh. set for a long time, but you're yeah, but a first time writer. I told right. Jeff, I you're saying Jeff, I've never directed a film. I've never directed a commercial. I've never directed uh, a high school play. But I know this world, and I know that by surrounding myself with great collaborators, production designers, costumers, cameramen, women, that sort of thing, that I knew that I could tell this story. And Jeff, I remember it as is, is, is though it were yesterday. And Jeff said, so this is your first time. Yeah, I said, it is. He said, well, I've had a lot of success with first-time directors, the fabulous Baker Boys being one of them. Oh, so good. He said, I'm in. And, you know, Alex, at that point, it, uh, my life was never the same. And so I have to ask you, first day on set, mm. you're sitting, you're, you're, you're the big man on, you're a big man on campus, first day. How do you deal with not only the pressure of the first day and making sure that you make that first day, but you're looking through the lens and you see Jeff Bridges there, like, and you're directing a legend, multiple legends, by the way, in that film. Oh, yeah. How, how do you deal with that as a director? Well, you deal with it by forgetting to call cut. And, and my AD, Karen Cho, is looking at me as the scene had finished. And I'm trans, and this is the truth, and I'm transfixed. And and she looked at me and she said, and I said, cut. And, that was it. and literally, it was like, my God. I remember that night that Jeff Bridges is, 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 is taking dialogue that I have written and taking it to places that I never expected. And that's, especially because I've written it specifically for him, that's the, the sign of a great actor. And now, uh, Five films later, it's it's happened in uh, in every film, thankfully. So the the one thing that's so impressive about your work, not only the writing and the directing, but the cast that you're able to attract, is 
honestly unheard of. I mean, your second film, that list of actors, any one of them could have been the star, but a lot of them took secondary roles because they wanted to work on the project. How do you attract all of these? I mean, and it's film after film after film after film. As I'm going through your filmography, I'm just like, how the hell is this guy grabbing? I know it's the material, but like even good material doesn't attract a lot of times because of politics and schedules and yes. this or all, that. Yeah, very it, often that is, that, that is the case. It's difficult to, because yeah. all the actors you, that you're referring to, everybody else wants. And right. trying, to fit, trying to fit them into a schedule is all, oh. very often one of the most difficult things to do about making a film. But I think, look, certainly the success of, 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 Crazy Heart has helped when when your film, your first film is nominated for three Oscars and wins a couple. That certainly changes the calculus for everybody else when they see how wonderful Jeff is and Maggie and Colin and Duvall and, and on and on and on, right? So um, that probably doesn't happen if that film doesn't have the success that it did. And then Out of the Furnace had uh, kind of like a murderer's row of actors that uh, <laughs> all of whom are, uh, you know, considered to be favorites of mine. So I think uh, once those two films um, were made, I think actors felt like, you know what, he, I, I can feel safe with Scott because that's the key is, is to, to really make an actor feel very safe, uh, safe to take big risks, knows that I'm going to protect them not only on the day when we're shooting, but also in the cutting room. Um, I think the actors that we're talking about know that I'm more interested in films that push me into an uncomfortable space. I've spoken to all of them about the great danger is, is really doing safe work where all of the, the edges are sanded off so that a lot of people will like your film. The Academy or people who are voting bodies, right? Um, and I think they realize that uh, those don't, those concerns don't really concern me. So it's all about telling a very honest, story a very authentic story and a story that's not afraid to um uh not let the audience off the hook i think um striving for consensus is not something that i tend to do i don't make films out of fear and certain actors respond to that and so and th another thing about working with all of these amazing actors is i know that all of them have very different processes so oh, as yeah. a director oh. I mean, as a director, how do you handle like when you have, you know, four or five different of these actors in a in a scene, you can't just yell out direction. You got to no, kind of go. Well, first and, I never do that. I, I only yes. give direction to actors that nobody hears but the actor. I make sure the exactly sound mixer has turned off all mics so nobody on set will hear the direction that I give Sam Shepard. Right. Or Robert Duvall, Christian, whomever it is. Um, I think. Well, I don't think I know. You have to be very specific with actors. Don't talk in the abstract. Uh, it's really about who is your character? What does the character want in the scene? What's the subtext? And again, make them feel safe, safe and free to take big risks. And every actor comes at uh, a scene differently. Casey Affleck and Willem Dafoe couldn't be more dissimilar in terms of their right. acting styles. Yeah. And you have to, on the day, balance those styles to make sure that all ideas are welcome, but that we're all trying to serve the theme of the film. And what's the subtext of a theme? And then you, when you cast people like Willem Dafoe, who's made, I don't know, probably 100 films, or Christian, who's made 50, Duvall, who's made 100. I mean, it's like, uh, and I've said this before, it's almost as though you're like a jockey at the, that I would imagine one to be at the Kentucky Derby. You're on the best. And it's a little bit of guidance here, a little bit of guidance there. Show them the whip, you know, and then let them run the rest of the work. I mean, that's the key is like not getting in their way and helping. And as Duvall would always say to me, the key to being a successful director of performances, which is what I hope I am, is knowing how to help an actor when he or she is in trouble. Now, with Crazy Heart, you I mean, again, you, you're very rare example of your first film being nominated for three oscars it doesn't happen quite very often how did you well, there's a lot of danger in that man i gotta be honest. yeah i that that was my question how did you handle the pre, not only the pressure the accolades the you're the greatest the ego trips 
uh, being in the center of that hurricane. And then after winning, you know, the, the film winning a few, a couple Oscars and how the town treated you, because Hollywood's a dangerous place. Oh, yeah. And and but you already had been in town a bit as an actor. So you've seen a few the things respect. that I'm at home. Oh, yeah. So how did you deal with it, man? Well, by making a film that was the complete polar opposite, um, uh, which was out of the furnace, which you know I hoped to make as an elegiac crime film, right? That that would uh, remind me of a smaller version of the Deer Hunter, right? And you feel like, okay, well, you're definitely not going to sand off the edges. You're not going to strive for consensus. You're going to make a film that uh, is as hard hitting as uh, the people experience who actually live there, right? And fortunately, that's where Christian and I met uh, in Braddock, Pennsylvania, Mayor John Fetterman, who's now the um, uh, senator from Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. And I know how tough uh, it was to live in a place like that, probably still is in Braddock. So uh, if you're being authentic to telling the story, that's really the key. And you don't worry about what others will say. Um, you don't worry about what Academy voters will say, you don't worry about what critics say, because if you look at most of Stanley Kubrick's films, they were uh, not well received when they first came out. All of them almost. I think all of them unanimously were not well received. And, and uh, time is what settles the score, right? So often you see movies that go on to win Oscars and receive acclaim and you watch them two, three, four years later, if not sooner, and you, and, and you realize that they don't really hold up. Right. So if you're if you're playing and these actors that I work with know that you're playing for the long game. And really what what means something to me is that when, when I hear from people who are also filmmakers who have uh, responded to me, whether it's uh, Bogdanovich with Crazy Heart, whether it was Michael Cimino calling me or or um, uh, William Friedkin after seeing Out of the Furnace, you know, Michael Mann, who is uh, has been very kind to me. Mike Nichols, like all of these people that I admire who really who reach out to you after seeing your films and and and, and continue to, uh, you know applaud you to continue to push. How how do you as a I mean as a filmmaker there's so many traps with that because you, you know when you're getting your you're basically the people you admire calling you telling you that you're great and to keep going the ego has to fall into how do you keep that in place because that's a problem when you have well, so much danger to art yeah quite yes honestly. and yeah. and you have to uh of course my wife would disagree when saying that i feel like i have no ego she says I've changed this um, wives do that <laughs> yes they do but, but ultimately it's really about serving the story about telling the stories that um uh that you want to tell, and you and look, Alex. The, what you try to do is is try to keep ego out of any decisions that you make, mm -hmm. um, which is often uh, very difficult for artists to do. Whether you're a, a painter, or whether you're a musician, you know, whether you're a filmmaker. Jeff Bridges said to me, "I don't care what happens to a movie when it comes out in terms of winning awards. That that the reward is is in the journey for him." And it's the experience and the more movies that I make, that's the truth. It's when you and a group of gifted collaborators are are all striving for the same goal. And I think that's really important. I think also I have tended to try to figure out how the how to tell the truth about how tragic and unfair life is without losing hope. You know, most narratives lie to the audience about how life works out. And uh, shocking. And, yes. And I try Hollywood Hollywood does that. No, you're kidding me. <laughs> yes. So that's, um, that's their bread and butter. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So for me, really, it's 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 about, um, you know, working through the difficulties in my life by dressing them through art. Um, Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, yeah. the, one, the one thing that's not spoken of a lot about in in the filmmaking space, especially in the film schools and for young filmmakers coming up, is the politics of the set. As mm -hmm. a first time director, you know, you have collaborators who you might have chosen wrong, you know, incorrectly that you didn't align with what you wanted or or try to enforce their vision on top of the director. Have you dealt with any of that? And if you have, how did you overcome it? No, frank frankly, I haven't um, because Good. I, I didn't think so. I, having not gone to film school, actually, all six of my films have been incredibly harmonious. Okay. Now I work with the same crew largely over and over because we have a shorthand. 
And, you know, my films are not inexpensive and every moment counts and every minute is, you know, uh, you can just hear the dollar signs. I think it was Kubrick again who, who said that actually prepping is much easier, editing is you're much more relaxed. But when you're shooting, it's like you're in this cauldron of fire because you have to make so many decisions every day and you're dealing with production designers, actors, cameramen and women, sound, um, everything is coming together at once. So the key is how do you hire people that see the world as you do, who will make, push you to become a better filmmaker? Mm. Because I didn't go to film school and all of my film school is, is reading as much as I can about film directors, watching their movies over and over and over with the sound off, how do they move the camera? Uh, most importantly, when they don't move it, um, how they use composition and mise-en-scene and lighting, staging, to help tell a story um, and, and which is more and more difficult because we're living in the most impatient of ages because of this, mm -hmm. right? And because we're getting our instant, uh, uh, in social media, we're getting instant gratification constantly and that we, we're no longer patient. And you have to, you have to really resist that when you're making a film, because if you were to put an audience today in front of 2001, oh. I had no idea what that was. Barry Lyndon, um, uh, The Godfather even, and they'd never heard of these actors or seen it, people would find them. It's painfully slow, boring, and if they were watching at home, they would turn it off. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And you have to resist that. You have to say, okay, well, this is the story I'm telling. People might find it to be a slow burn. But I've said this before, making, you know, experiencing a film in a cinema is not like getting an enema. You don't want to have wanted to get over as fast as possible luxuriate in Stanley Kubrick's world or in Jane Campion's world or countless other filmmakers that have inspired me for years, right? That's the key. So, so it's really about trying to eschew any ego, hire people that see the world as you do, know their work incredibly well, take meetings with them, and then you'll just learn to push one another. I mean, even when you work with trusted collaborators, there will be moments on set where there is Sturm und Drang. And as the director and as the writer and as the producer, you have to be able to solve those issues. You also have to be open and realize that all ideas are welcome. And that is the key. You can't only just say it's my way. You have to have a very strong vision, but it's clear that there are people that you hire who will bring ideas to make you not only a better filmmaker, but make the film better. Now, how do you approach the writing process? Because your 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 work is so character driven. Um, how do you how do you just deal well, with from, the, from, the writing from, process from, in general? Quite quite frankly, and and I I work very long stretches um, from early in the morning um, through lunch, take a break, and then get back at it because I do kind of what Coppola did, which is like this vomit draft where you don't go back and edit. You literally write the story from page one to page 120, however long it is, without going back to edit. And reading it, and it very often will be terrible, to see if if this is a story that you would want to race out to see on Friday night. That's my litmus test. And before I became a writer, I would study Robert Towns' work. I would study Friedkin's work. I would study uh, the network, Patty Shiesty, whoever. Oh. And, I would, and I would try to understand, these are all people who write characters. How is it? that they're telling the story largely through subtext and they're telling it visually. They're telling it with spare dialogue, all these sort of things that you just keep writing. Writing is rewriting. And, and eventually you come to a place where you feel like you can share a screenplay with Robert Duvall, who was the first one to, to read Crazy Heart. Or now the person who reads all my scripts, whether he's in the or not, is Christian Bale, right? Christian's been making films since he's 12. He'll tell you if the story of the character is working quickly. And it's great to have, and I'm very fortunate to have those kind of trusted collaborators who, who read my things and uh, help guide me because so often, and even in the editorial process, you get very snowblind, you know, snowblind and you can't quite see, think things are great, but then there are other people who will come in and say, mm, this didn't quite land for me, this isn't working, this is overstated, this is understated. So all of those sort of things I'm just getting a text from my pal Casey Affleck right now. Speaking of Casey, <laughs> hey, Casey. 
So Alex, that's really it, man. It's, it's about um, how do you use other people's ideas? Look at, I mean, I can't say enough to young filmmakers, read great screenplays. See not only what a writer is trying to express, but what they aren't. So much is, is left to the unspoken. And that's <laughs> where you'll make a real connection with the audience. And I tell people all the time, first time filmmakers, um, tell the truth. Write stories that are close to you that you know and personalize everything. Because then if you do it, your theme will become universal and it will speak to most everybody because we're all suffering, right? And we all, if you, if you deign to make the kind of films that I do and you want to move people or you want to um, uh, challenge people, um, a great filmmaker who shall uh, remain unnamed once said to me, and this guy's one of the greats, he said, Scott, if everybody likes your film, it's likely not very good. <laughs> very true. Now, do you outline at all? If I'm adapting something, I do. Okay. If I'm writing an original, it's funny because and I use Kubrick again because I've read everything he's ever said. Right? Oh, me, me too, my friend. Me too. I watched all of his interviews. And he would never uh, direct an original screenplay. It always has to be based on existing material because he says you can sit down in one sitting and tell this is a story that I want to tell. This is what I want to spend the next five years of my life. Outlining can be really quite helpful. Um, if, if, if there's existing, The Pale Blue Eye, very sprawling novel, uh, more characters than I could, uh, that I could or should explore in a two hour time frame, different if you're making a limited series. Um, something that's longer, more sprawling, you should certainly outline. But an original screenplay, it helps, it helps to give you guideposts as you're writing for sure. But certainly if you're adapting something, and it's really all about um, finding the essence of the novel or nonfiction piece or uh, uh, magazine article, whatever it is you're adapting, podcast. And then it helps to outline that for sure. But there's also something very freeing about not knowing where a narrative is going. You have a, a kernel of an idea, like out of the furnace, and off I went and just wrote. And I was doing press for Crazy Heart. I was in Pittsburgh drove over to Braddock, Pennsylvania, wrote very specifically for all of these locations, took images, and out of that came the narrative. So um, I do both. Um, I've just just uh, adapted something that, that uh, I hope to make, certainly my next film or, or the film after that, and I didn't uh, outline. I'd read the novel four or five times. William Goldman would certainly, once he realized he was going to read something, read it two or three times. Did I like it the second time as much as the first? What are the themes? Who are the characters that I'm going to excise? Who are the characters I'm going to focus on? That's that's the piece that I just uh, that I've just adapted. With that um, when you have someone who's given you a great piece of of uh, source material, like for instance Lewis Bayard and the Pale Blue Eye, um, you can take that. And, and, and if the author knows and understands that a film is very different than a book, you could just use a seed and off you go. So it really is, is project continuum of whether I outline or not. I don't do it now, always. Now, as directors, there's always that day on set where we feel like the entire world's coming crashing down around you. The sun's... You, oh, every, day. The, yeah. every, every, every day there is that. But there's that one day that's like, oh, I don't think we're going to make it. That day that you're like, holy cow... What was that day on any of your projects and how did you overcome it? Well, you never have enough time, Ever. Shoot, honestly, even though you've got, man, I've got 55 days to shoot this. Jesus, I had 24 for Crazy Heart. <laughs> and then every day, by the time you're finished, you, you there are no easy days on a film set. Um, one of them, of course, is, is if you have to vacate a, lo a location because it's a restaurant, that you've rented oh, yeah. out or someone's house and they're ready to move back in. Uh, or it can be because you have um, monsoonal rains coming. And that would have been in um, uh, Hostiles where I was shooting the sequence towards the end of the film where Rory Cochran's character, before he um, 
um, before he meets his maker and it's pouring rain and it's, I think it's probably 38 degrees. Uh, it's going to be snowing later. Rory is, is dressed only in a very thin shirt, but we hadn't quite gotten the scene, but I could tell that he was, he was very affected by the weather and was starting to become hypothermic. I'm not a doctor. I'm supposing I can see how it was affecting him. Um, and these monsoonal rains up in the continental divide, uh, you just can't control, but it was giving me everything that I wanted in the scene. So you're trying to balance somebody's health with also trying to know that you have to vacate a location, uh, vacate a location and, and trying to balance the scene. But, and I would go to Rory, I would say, listen, I think we have this. Um, but, but I'm also very concerned that, that you are experiencing something now that you shouldn't be. No, Scott, I haven't quite gotten it, is what Rory would say. We're going to keep pushing. And then you're sitting behind the monitor or next to the lens, and you're thinking, okay, man, I've got to stop him because he'll keep going until, until he falls down because he's that kind of actor. He's so great, Rory Cotton, mm -hmm. one of the great actors I've worked with. Um, so scenes like that that really uh, uh, pressure you or when – the monsoonal rains and rattlesnakes have come out of the ground. They're everywhere, but you're still shooting, you know, those sort of things. Um, so you just have to, it's all about really balancing. And, you know, if you're eight, 10,000 feet above sea level and oxygen is very difficult for people. Oh, it's, yeah. like, it's always trying to balance those sort of things or shooting the pale blue eye and, and it's eight below zero. And um, those are long days. And you want to make certain that the crew are well taken care of. But if you're the writer, director, producer, and you're in a location and you're focused on that, and then but you're also concerned about the crew's uh, uh, well-being, you know, those are things that you really uh, have to juggle as a filmmaker that they certainly don't teach you in film school. Having not gone to film school, I, I don't know for sure, but I suspect they don't. Rattlesnakes, do bears, elevation. I, mi I miss the rattlesnake uh, bears uh, monsoon <laughs> exactly. uh, class. Uh, right. When I went, at least it wasn't there. It wasn't in the curriculum when I went. So, <laughs> yes, right. Maybe there should be a class on that. There I mean, if welcome, someone's listening at USC, welcome to hell at USC. <laughs> USC film school should have that exactly. Yeah. Now, um, I've talked to so many writers that when they are when they're writing, and it happens. It's happened to me. It happens to every writer. I think is when you're writing, you you're almost channeling you're almost like oh, it's something no flowing through you to with point to the point where after you're done you look at it and you go holy crap who wrote this this is good <laughs> almost every time and quite frankly it comes from a very deep subconscious place i mean you're very conscious as you're writing it but you're not questioning it my wife asks me that all the time when she when she reads something she's like jesus where did this come from and you can't quite really understand it and and quite frankly the more films you make and the more experience you become not only as a, as a film director but as a film writer the more difficult it gets about saying less and not over imparting to the audience and trying to give them enough uh information uh to keep them satisfied but not too much information and that's where you become more conscious about it but generally as you're writing if if, if you're in that flow and that stream of consciousness and it's coming from a place don't question it and don't stop so it, it seems like it's, you know, we, we could call it the other side, the ether, wherever ideas come from. I think Spielberg talked about it. And um, I think Prince and Michael Jackson talked about it as well, like where ideas come from. And I think Spielberg said in an interview where he's like, if an idea comes to me, I know that if I don't act on it in a week or two, I'll hear that Marty got it or someone else got it because the idea needs to be birthed into the world. And they chose you first. But if you don't move. They'll move on to the next one. <laughs> Look, and those are our three geniuses that you just mentioned. So I wouldn't question any of that. But I think he's probably uh, right. Um, and I try not to. I try not to question anything, honestly, um, in terms of where it comes from. Because when you make the kind of films that that I make, you you have to understand that um, no two people see the same film. Right. And which is why I think it's so frankly absurd to rank art as we do in America. What's the best? You know, who do you who do you think's a better uh painter? Cy Twombly or Jackson Pollock? You're gonna have varying uh, <laughs> uh 
responses, right? From a number of people uh, when you present them with that. Or who's better, My, Miles or, or Coltrane, right? Those were things. So the fact that we that we rank art is something that for a whole other discussion, Alex. But you can't really be concerned with any of that when you are making um, a film. Or when, when you're writing. Well, and, so, and where things come from. Don't so, think about how are people going to receive this? Oh, it? God, no, you can't think that. No, you have to just let it come out. Yes. And, and and that's where I think a lot of writers... The work will be generic and for, for easily forgotten. One thing I've noticed with your work is it seems that there hasn't been a drop-off, meaning that the level that you were able to set, the, the bar you were able to set with Crazy Heart, you've been able to keep that film after film on the right. level of the writing and the directing. Because to be honest, and I know you know this as well, there are directors who pop, but then they overthink. Yeah. Or they and, and and you could start seeing it in their work. They, their work starts to drop off. Unfortunately, do you think when you wrote Crazy Heart, where you were basically there was no pressure to write Crazy Heart? No, none. No, Other nobody. No, no. So it was such a freeing experience that you let go. Yes. Do you are you able to continuously do that with your work, or do you start to do you get in your own way and stop that flow sometimes from happening? Well, both. Um, only because uh, my work. Um, explores the darker corners of the human psyche. And since Crazy Heart had gotten progressively darker, um, although Pale Blue Eye is certainly is not that. I mean, that's much more accessible. Um, so you try to guard against that only because you know that your films affect people in ways. I mean, I've been to countless screenings over the last six movies where people have come out of my films as though they were just you know, festivals, screenings, as they were just hit by a two by four. And uh, you can tell that it, they were deeply moved or deeply uh, angered or upset, whatever it is. Um, so, you, you know, you're sometimes mindful of that, like, God, you know, I, and I never try to make the same film twice. You make a music film, you make a gangster movie, a Western horror, <laughs> horror family, horror trauma with antlers and now this. Um, so I never try to repeat myself, but I also never let the audience off the hook. And that is is something that you sometimes have to be reminded of because look, we want, I mean, movies are an expensive endeavor and their investors <laughs> want their movies at least to break even, but they want to make money. You know, it, it is cliche as it is, it is show business and not show art. So I've been lucky to make the kind of films that I make. Um, and Quite frankly, I think actors and, and other directors, whether they're my contemporaries or people that I have long, long admired and became a filmmaker because of them, have embraced my work in ways that the public just isn't aware of. And that really keeps you going. Um, Walter Hill, got an email from Walter today telling me how much that he loved Pale Blue Eye and what he thinks of my same the reason I bring it up is because you just mentioned it and how he's seen my career um, Ascend, and, and if, you know, I think people are, are thankful uh, when directors um, really respect the audience and want to give them something that's challenging and something that's different, and most importantly, something that, and I do believe this, will stand the test of time. Let me, I got to ask you this question because, I mean, we, you and I are both of a generation that remembers all those great filmmakers you talked about, all those great movies uh, from the 70s and the 60s and the and the 80s. Uh, and I feel like those kind of filmmakers, and uh, to be honest, filmmakers like yourself are an ex endangered species right now because of what's happening in the in the business. There's, it's it's just getting crazier and crazier. And, and if it wasn't for people like Netflix, you know, A Pale Blue Eye, which is your new movie. Oh, man. That's not getting a theatrical release today. That's not being made today. It just it wouldn't get made unless it was with a streamer who wants to do that kind of work. Uh, because the studios, honestly, if Scorsese's having a problem getting his films made, yep. <laughs> and, and he has to go to Netflix to get Irish, trouble. we're all in trouble. So and Apple's well, making his new film. Right, exactly. So what do you think about the, the the future of where we're going, man. Because no. as a film lover, I'm seeing I'm seeing a problem. The new generation I, coming up is it's it's, it's, it's a problem. I, I mean, Christian and I just spoke about it today, because 
The Pale Blue Eye is debuting on Netflix. It's been in theaters for the last two weeks. I mean, I'm eternally grateful that Netflix have allowed this film, should people want to see it in the big screen experience, to debut in the top markets all over the world. You've got two weeks to see it in a theater if you want to see that. And should you want to wait until it comes to your house, which is what most people will do to your home theater, that's how the majority of people will see my film, then that's how they're going to see it. I am eternally grateful that Netflix, Apple, um, Amazon are making films that the legacy studios no longer want to make because those are the films that, that the reason I became a filmmaker and the movies that still excite me. I mean, I've been asked to do um, major uh, superhero films or the kind of films that, that guarantee a, um, an audience. I've been offered those many times and have, uh, as of yet, uh, elected not to do them because I want to tell these stories. Uh, stories that make me want to race out to see a film on a Friday night. It, it's getting tougher and tougher because if you look at this fall and some of my pals, their films that debuted in cinemas, just no one came to see them. And these are excellent films. And right. um, made with the highest uh, uh, craftsmanship and great performances. And it, it's it's a bit terrifying and we're you know we're heading into uh potentially um uh a strike year we yeah. oh god that's potentially, right potentially could be facing um could be facing you know economic headwinds so all of these things make it more difficult for people to get their films made certainly more difficult than than it does for scorsese or 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 uh your those land most of myself whoever are making you know challenging adult uh dramas um but still it's never easy and and i fear that uh people until we're really beyond covid which we certainly are not um i think an older audience won't come back and i think ticket price is probably going to have to come down to to entice people to come back to the cinemas but i can assure you because if you look around the world there's such great cinema being made Yes. Year in and, out. and those are the films that I most respond to, quite frankly, are international filmmakers um, who've inspired me uh, a great deal over the last 15, 20 years. Um, they're still getting their films made. Uh, their, their, their home countries sometimes help subsidize them, which we don't quite have here. Um, uh, it is getting tougher, but, I, but I, then every year movies come out and you think, OK, great. This is why we love cinema. It's just, just getting harder and harder, Alex. And um, yeah. here's what I'll tell any filmmaker. You should make the film you're about to make as though it's your last. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, a lot of times, well, first of all, I think what you said about the foreign films, we're getting access to them so much easier now because of streaming oh, services. Yes. They're just coming in and something like Parasite winning the Oscar and things like that, that would have never happened no. 10, 20 years ago. It just wouldn't have happened. So that's a good, those are good signs. But the younger generation of filmmakers coming out, because I, I teach these filmmakers, I they they listen to me all the time and and they watch the show and it, it's, it, I'm, I, and I see them at festivals and I see them at events and I talk to them and it's just, it's so much harder now to get stuff off the ground than it was before, and especially to tell the kind of challenging stories uh, that you're telling. And and, and I mean, any of Sp uh, Kubrick's films, any of them, try to oh. release them today. Oh. Any Kubrick film today, release it. it, it it's not po it's not even possible. You, can you imagine the sh Clockwork Orange I watched the other day? Oh, Just the first, yeah. the, the first 20 minutes of that, I'm like, you can't release that today. It's just not. In today's environment, you can't release a film like that. No, no, or ta Taxi true. Driver. No. Taxi oh Driver. God. Are you kidding? Well, it's, are your students dispirited from, from following their passions? Or do they just no. realize it's going to be a tougher uh, road to hope? Well, this is the thing, man. I, I, I think that filmmakers, the younger film generation coming up, are still stuck a lot of times in the glory days, which 
in many ways for our generation was the 90s, which was the independent film movement, oh, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, Sundance yeah. movement where, and I've spoken to a lot of these filmmakers, you know, the Ed Burns and the Robert Rodriguez's and the Tarantinos, these guys that, that they were legendary stories of what happened in the 90s. And they're stuck into that world to like think that that's the path. And I keep yelling from the top of the, of the mountain, this is not the way anymore, guys. You can't, I talked to Ed Burns about Brothers McMullen. That movie wouldn't make it today. Clerks wouldn't make it today. El Mariachi wouldn't make it today. Slacker wouldn't make it today. It's uh. these, and, and they think that that's the path. So then I have to kind of break that illusion a bit. And then they go, well, what do I do? And I go, you, the, the game is so different now. And it's so much easier to make a film, but it's so much harder to get it seen. Because when, when we were coming up, it was impossible to make a film. It cost, you needed 35, you needed 16 if you were lucky, and then you had to really understand technology. You really need to understand lighting. Now, anyone can make, you know, I had Sean Baker on a few a couple times on my show, what with, with, he did with uh, Tangerine, with the iPhone, and and cameras are so cheap and things look so good. Yeah, Sean, Sean's doing it the right way. Sean, no, Sean is amazing. And he's, you know, Red Rocket. I loved Red Rocket. I saw I saw that in the theater, shot that 16. It was yeah. great. But that, but that it, it's it's I think people are starting to get disheartened a bit. And I think what where our generation looked into the 90s, let's say, for for hope. And of course, obviously the 70s and the 80s and the 60s and the great filmmakers and the legends. We were we went kind of like if you remember when that when everybody wanted to grow up to be a rock star, right? Then in the 90s, everybody wanted to grow up to be a director because Quentin made it so cool and Robert made it so cool. And, and it was just like everybody. Yeah, yeah so Soderbergh, everybody was, it was so cool to be a director. Now, the younger generation, then they want to be content creators. Wow. They want to be YouTubers to tell their stories. And they're able to monetize there much faster than they could with film. And then don't get me started about film distribution, which is a whole other world that I've, I'm have i deep into as far as independent film distribution. So it's just a difficult, it's so hard, man. At certain levels, yeah, you, you're going to get the Ryan Kuglers that come out of film school and and, and and make some great films and your film like crazy hard. These, but these are anomalies. I mean, yeah. your story is an anomaly, right? I, so I, I don't know. I don't know where this conversation is going, but I just love to hear your thoughts on where you think from your point of view. Well, now you make me just crawl up in the fetal position. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus, Alex. I don't mean, I don't well, mean, we have, look, Guillermo del Toro, who, who right. my film Antlers, and yes. uh, who's a great pal of mine, oh. said to me, he said, look, you know, if, if COVID reminds us of anything, we know that we need food, we need shelter, we need medicines, and we need stories. And we will always need films who will always, always need long form television whether it's content as you mentioned uh, on youtube whether it's uh, short films people need stories we always have ever since when we go back to cavemen right oh, of course of course, so, of course uh and cave art in uh the caves in france and elsewhere so that i'm not concerned about what i am concerned about are the economic headwinds the difficulty to entry for the, market, uh, the marketplace, the marketplace and distribution. And, and my hope is that, that, and I, and I don't know that we're on the tail end of, of COVID. Uh, uh, yeah. Hopefully. I still have it now. And it's, and, and it's as bad as ever, as intense as ever. Um, hopefully once people come back, the older audience come back to cinemas, perhaps it will get easier, but I don't know that film going, is the first choice for 18 to 34 year olds. I have kids, they love going to the cinema. Mm -hmm. They try to go as often as possible, but it's also because I'm a film director. And of course. They and their friends love to go to the movies, but they're also on TikTok all the time. And they're on uh, Instagram and they're on uh, YouTube. phones, YouTube. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, there are many things that are challenging our time for movies. It's, it's 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 expensive and time consuming to get to the to the cinema. I hope that that changes. I hope that 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 it will shake out with COVID and the Lega Studios now realize that making films like the films that I make are more important. But it's really all about economics. It always has been. 
But, you know, it, it has. But I think that <clears throat> the studios are now run by corporations and by boards oh, of directors. Oh, yeah. But before they were run by filmmakers. Yes. You know, you know, I mean, arguably Iger, Bob Iger is probably the only guy who understands. And, and look what he's done with Disney, for God's sakes. Yeah. He, thank God he's back. And thank God he's back. He understood. He understands storytelling, understands filmmaking. But I remember growing up, I worked at a video store and we would have movies like What About Bob? You know, and these smaller films Shot in Virginia, my home right? State. Exactly. So these smaller films with big stars at, at nice budgets, you know, 10 million, 15 million, that there was yeah. a shot. They would do 10 of those and one would pop and the other ones would do OK. And then maybe two or three would bomb. But they will all work together and there was more content, more ideas, more things. And that's why we're going back to those times to mine those ideas, because everyone's terrified of doing that kind of stuff right now, where Netflix and Amazon and Apple aren't scared to do that because their business model is different. That's right. And I suspect that uh, there are a lot of different streaming platforms, which are expensive for people to have six or eight of them. <laughs> uh, I, I imagine that there will be fewer going forward, and but those will still be uh, uh, providing great content. And that's, of course, Netflix and Apple and and Amazon, uh, Disney Plus, who are, who are well capitalized. But then I think you'll probably also see some consolidation. And uh, mm -hmm. the less buyers, the worse off for all of us. Agreed, my friend. Agreed. That's without Thank question. God we have companies like Sony Pictures Classics and my good friends at Fox Searchlight, who Fox, yeah, a yeah. couple of my films, and they and they really are, are run by filmmakers. Thank God, films. Uh, year in and year out, uh, they're uh, great supporters of filmmaking. A twenty four, yeah, A twenty four, and 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 uh, and now and of course Netflix. Netflix has a whole division that will allow you to make Roma or Bardo or uh, Power of the Dog or The Pale Blue Eye or on and on and on. And, and hopefully we can continue to make that because there's so many young filmmakers who are listening to this podcast or your podcast in general who have stories to tell and should be absolutely. Told. And, and, there's no and if you can, and if you have that burning desire that says, this is the only thing I can do with my life, which is ultimately what I said, then you'll find a way to succeed and tell your story. A Amen, brother. I think that's the, that's the key is it's not, and, and maybe you should, maybe you can back me up on this. It's always not about the talent, um, but perseverance. Cause there's a lot of people oh, yeah. who are, who are around they're like, man, they're they're not the best, but they just stuck it out. They just survived. Oh yeah, we all know examples of that for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that's something they don't teach you in film school. It's like, I don't yeah. look Michael Jackson. Uh, Michael Jackson. Michael Jordan got cut from his high school team. Talent wasn't enough. Talent wasn't. He had to go and hustle and work and build it up and keep going. And and that's something that I try to I try to yell from the top of the mountain here as well. Yeah, yeah, show. yeah. Hey, if you have my pal Adam Sandler on to talk about hustle. Please, I would love to have Adam on the show. Please call him up and let him know because I love Hustle. This is the way. show he should be on. I, I don't know it. why he didn't come on Hustle. I love, by the way, love that movie. Love yeah, that. He's, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a great, great man, and he's great in the film. And and he's uh, and, and if you want to talk about Adam, and people always ask, like, how come Adam keeps getting all these this deal on, on Netflix? And I always say, like, the reason why is because when you're on Friday night with your wife sitting on Netflix and you're scanning all those thumbnails and you see Adam's face, you go, oh, I know what I'm going to get. And I'm going to get something oh, that's going to be. And he delivers, man. And he's, he's either going to be super funny or when he gets into his dra dramatic stuff, which he's so underrated in his dramatic oh, acting. He's a great person. Um, he and he just he gets it and he understands his brand. He understands what he's doing. Yes, and man, he uh, other. Unlike any other actor, I really he's he's done such amazing stuff over the years. Oh, yeah. uh, whether you like his films, or, yeah, whatever you like, I don't care if people like his films or not. Everyone has their opinions on stuff, but you can't deny what the man has done and oh, continues gosh, to no. do. And keeps knocking it out of the park. Um, I love Tussle. I love Tussle. So I can't say enough about that. Good pal. Um, I love the guy. So let's talk about the pale blue eye. Uh, you know, with Netflix, uh, I, you know, it looks beautiful, dude. It's stunning. Okay. It is stunningly shot. It almost reminded, it almost has a, a sleepy hollow vibe to it as far as yeah, the, I guess. It, yeah, that's right. That, that has that kind of texture. Well, uh, that's color gothic aesthetic for sure. Yeah. 
It's it's stunning, man. So tell me how that that whole thing came to be and and how you were able. I mean, I'm assuming you gave the script to Christian. Christian said yes, and then Netflix said yes. Yeah, yeah. He read it probably uh, oh I don't know ten or twelve years ago after we did Out of the Furnace. And wow. He loved it then, but he was too young to 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 play uh, Augustus Landor, the world weary detective. He was too old to play um, Edgar Allan Poe, but we'd always talked about it. I mean, I've written a lot of things that that I think he and I will make at some point. It's all about, as we discussed early on in the podcast, all about timing, availability, what we feel like making. Um, but we both were interested in what drives someone to madness, how much pressure has to build before they explode in violence, You know, what causes morality and decency to erode an otherwise decent people. Right. Real horrors seldom have easy explanations. And that's what we wanted to uh, explore with the story. In terms of the aesthetic, it was a, it was a brutal shoot. As, as oh, most of mine are. My, my wife thinks I'm a masochist. But like I said, it was incredibly cold. Those bracing winds coming uh, from the northeast are just uh, almost Revenant style. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was tough. Um, but that was all in serving kind of this um, gothic aesthetic. And and really trying to serve as a, a, a an Edgar Allan Poe origin story. That the two hours that take place in this film motivate Poe to become the writer that we know and love, the writer of the macabre, the, the man who bequeathed to us detective and horror fiction, uh, the man who writes about tragedy and death and the satanic and the occult, and where life ends and death begins. All of those sort of things that kind of course through this narrative. And I thought that, again, in, in trying not to do safe work, uh, Christian stood on that ledge with me and, and we both took the, took the leap and were, uh, yeah. So once I uh, attached Christian, uh, my agents at Creative Artists took the uh, screenplay out and and we got a lot of bids from the legacy studios, a lot of bids from streamers, uh, but Netflix, um, made us an offer that we thought was too good to pass up in terms of having both a theatrical experience and um, streaming, my first platform experience. And also, uh, quite frankly, their, their, have, their ranks are filled with great filmmakers who really understood the film and allowed me to make the film that you see. Um, I hope that uh, people find it, you know, starting today on the, on the streamer and and allow people uh, coming behind me to make films that are uh, similarly um, uh, difficult to make in this marketplace. And uh, you know, you've worked with Christian so many times now. I mean, you guys are you know, you're the Scorsese to his De Niro at this point, or to, to his DiCaprio at this point. Uh, Christian is one of the greatest actors of his generation. There's no oh. no no question, one of the greatest actors of his generation. And his physical transformations that he's done over the course of his life, which I know has oh, harmed his health. Oh, it has harmed his health. They're, they're it's, unrivaled. There's nobody who's ever done anything at that again and again and again and again. From the machinist to Batman, you're like, what, how, how, could yeah. you, how? Um, it, it's really remarkable. What is the What is the biggest lesson you've learned working with an actor like him? No detail is too small. And always striving for the truth, always striving for excellence and realizing that we can always do better. And you need people like that to make you a better filmmaker. I've spoken about it publicly. Christian is my closest pal. He's my closest collaborator. He's like a brother to me. And uh, and I'm thankful that, that as a director, I've had someone who has served as, as a muse for, for the stories that I want to tell. And... Um, people continue to come out and see our work. It won't be the end of it, our collaboration for sure. <laughs> but he pushes me to be the best filmmaker I can be. And, and, and quite frankly, I admire him more off the set than I do on. He's, he's an incredibly devoted father and husband. And you never see Christian in the public eye. You never see him on talk shows because he always thinks the less the public knows about him, the more easily they will believe him as Batman or Dick Cheney or Augustus Landor in the pale blue eyes. You're, right. You're not thinking absolutely. about where he pumps his gas, who he's partying with, where he went for holiday. You never see it. Yeah, it's almost a Daniel Day Lewis vibe too. Because when Daniel did, he just you don't 
Nothing. You didn't knew nothing about it. He just show up three, 10 years later and go, I'll do a part now. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And and that way you're able to be transported with the filmmakers to a world and you never even question. Hold on, is he dating? You're right. You're, you're right. He's brilliant. He's brilliant on multiple yeah. levels without question. Yes. And, and now I have a, I continue to write for him. Now I have a few questions to ask all my guests. What advice yeah. would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Tell personal stories. Tell personal stories that you know uh, will connect in a very universal way to people in America, people in Iran, people in Afghanistan, people in Ukraine. All people need stories. Tell, make personal films. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? And it's difficult, but patience and to believe in yourself and to believe in your stories and to believe that you'll ultimately cultivate your talent in such a way that it will be undeniable that people will want to work with you, but it all takes patience and experience. And the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. I would say, um, even though I have uh, yet to make a documentary, I love them. I would say uh, Barbara Koppel's Harlem County, USA. Mm -hmm. That's a great movie. Something that really has influenced me. The Maisel Brothers Salesman mm -hmm. is another. Um, I would say Jean-Pierre Melville's Le Samurai. Nice. Very nice. Very nice list, my friend. Scott, brother, I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, and sharing all your knowledge and experience with the audience, man. And please continue That's making pleasure, movies, man. Great questions, man. Keep it up. And please, people, I, in, in all seriousness, don't lose faith. you got to tell stories. <laughs>